<laughs> Hello and welcome to the Verge Cast, the flagship podcast of staring directly down the barrel of the camera, whether it's your real eyes or fake computer generated eyes. These are real eyes here. These are fake. Beautiful right. real eyes. I'm your friend Eli. I have an announcement to make. This is going to be one of the first episodes of our show in a long time that we post as a video podcast to YouTube. We used to do it all the time. We yeah. used to do it live on video, oh. which was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> then to pay back the, the karmic debt of yeah. doing that, we, just stopped. we stopped the video right. and talk for years, and now we've slowly started adding it back in with everything that we've learned. Yeah. And what we've learned is that Richard has the NVIDIA software on his computer that makes his eyes stare directly at you no matter where he's looking, and it is terrifying. I can't look away. Hello, Richard. These are my real eyes. This is what I actually look like. This is not AI enhanced by NVIDIA. I, I am offended by, by this, this suggestion that I would use software to enhance the way that I look at you, because I always look directly at you. <laughs> So That's creepy. what people say about me all the time. <laughs> it's a lot. It's We're gonna... I love. It's eye contact. That's what I mean. <laughs> when I say karmic debt... It's like we're already accruing it. Like we paid off yeah. the balance. We're like, turn the camera back on. got like three off. episodes in like, us. I'm ringing it up. <laughs> Just making, making purchases that we're going to have to pay off. By AI yeah, is this isn't weird at all. Goodness. Alex Kranz is here. I am here. And I've got my own camera in the studio, and it's great. Uh, if you're in your car, you're, you're doing great because Richard isn't looking at you. But if you're watching this on video, here's Richard looking at you. All right. <laughs> And Monica Chen is joining us for the first segment of the show. Hey, Monica. Hello. I, you know, we're two minutes into doing this on video again. <laughs> There's Regret? There's a reason I turned the cameras off. I think we look great. I think this is the best thing we've ever done. <clears throat> well, look, let, me, let me start with some, like, inside. The funny thing is when, when I can just. No, get out of my frame. <laughs> I'm looking great. I can Hi. just get in Alex's camera. It looks like he's intently examining the wall. This is the worst radio sitting. that's ever been made. Here's what I will tell everyone. Just back it up inside media baseball. We used to do it on video all the time. Mm -hmm. We were arguably ahead of our time. Yes. In 2011, <laughs> live streaming a podcast. But podcast? Live streaming podcast, 2011. None of those things existed then. Younger, drunker Neelai <laughs> on camera live. <laughs> Many mistakes. There's some really good gifs out there of it, by the way. It's, it's incredible. Some, some of our finest moments. Yeah. Uh, who is the Samsung guy? Big Papa Joe, it's all, it's all. We hired people off the off the call-ins for the podcast. That's a true story. Whatever we, many things happen in the Virgcast. I'm sure people remember or don't. We started the Virgcast up again, and we're like, this is a lot of effort for videos. Yeah. That a small group of very passionate people watch. But we wanted the podcast to be big, and so we shut off the cameras to make a better radio show. Right. And our numbers went up because <gasps> we were no longer looking at each other and telling each other jokes about things we could see yeah. that no one in their cars could see. Yeah. So we were like, okay, we're good at making a podcast. So fast forward to 2023, everyone with a podcast is like, just turn on the cameras and put it on YouTube. That's where all the podcast growth is. Yeah. So now we're fully back to the future. We have potentially learned something <laughs> about making a better podcast by just having made a podcast for a long time. And we are not Alex... <laughs> Going to do bits to the camera. Never. <laughs> I'm not doing minutes. that today, tomorrow, <laughs> ever again. Hi, guys. How are you? Let it's me just talk to you personally. <laughs> Get out of my frame. <laughs> All right. So if you are listening to this and we get out of line, send us a polite, e polite, very polite email. We'll, we'll try to rein it in. If you're watching this for the first time on YouTube, welcome. Liam, what's the YouTube channel people can subscribe to? The Vergecast. <laughs> Just type the Vergecast into whatever text field you encounter on the internet, and it will lead you Ask to our Jeeves. YouTube page. <laughs> Yahoo.com. No, it's the it's YouTube, the Vergecast. That's our channel. You can watch you can watch us live. Love once it. Once again. You won't regret it. And Richard no. continues to stare directly at you the whole time. <laughs> Just unblinking. Can we let's talk about this, this technology? We have a lot to talk about. Monica's yeah. here to talk about uh, MacBook Pro and Mac Mini with M2 chip reviews, uh, Tesla earnings. We have a 
we have a headline here that just says Trouble in Alphabet City, which is very good. <laughs> so good. Uh, which is just about Google. Yeah. Uh, lots of problems for Google. Microsoft layoffs, Google layoffs. There's a lot to talk about. But we should talk about the fact that NVIDIA released this software for their video cards that lets you just stare at the camera. <laughs> This is not new technology, right? Uh, fa- it's built into FaceTime. Monica, you were saying it's built yeah, into a lot it's of been laptops. Yeah, it's been on the Surface line for a bit. Samsung has claimed to have a technology that does it, um, which I haven't personally used it before. HP says they have it. There are various people who have been trying it um, with varying degrees of success. But no one like Richard. Well, no. so the thing about <laughs> NVIDIA, right, it's because it you can set any video source to go through. Right. This yeah. Is a, this one is, is, a, is a bigger release. So, right, like you can't. Yeah, because usually if you're doing FaceTime, you have to be in the FaceTime app. On the FaceTime. And it's not as nearly as funny. Camera. Yeah. And then, yeah. Richard, this is just like NVIDIA Broadcaster, and you're just pumping OBS through it? What's yep. going on here? It, it, just, uh, it just connects. It you, I open up NVIDIA Broadcast, pick my camera, and then in our recording software, I just tell it to look for NVIDIA Broadcast, and it, it gets whatever whatever is piped there. Which is your cartoon eyes. Yes. I mean, it's, the eyes that it has drawn, and occasionally you'll see, like, if it decides that I've looked away too far, it'll go back to my real eyes, and then it will turn my eyes back to you. <laughs> and for, for me, that's the creepiest part, is the animated turn. Well, it would be weirder if they just, like, blinked out and then <laughs> blinked to be staring at us again. It's so strange good. because it's looking, it's like looking at like a ghost mirror of myself because I'm looking at myself down in the middle of the screen and it's looking directly back at me, <laughs> which is very strange. That's terrifying. Uh, we've, we've done a lot of stories about this tech recently. James Vincent has written a lot of stories about this kind of tech. His one today is very good. It's just about people putting movies through it. Yeah. So the actors are looking directly down. Nope, don't do that. And all of it looks like high school theater. <coughs> like the most dramatic high school monologues yeah. that you have ever experienced. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, I don't know if this is the future of all video conferencing. I know that it's very funny. And I also know that it's been on FaceTime for a minute and no one has noticed it. Yeah, true. And I think it's just because NVIDIA is letting basically anybody pump anything through it. That you and how use. many people use FaceTime? Like lots of people, but I like my mom is not like you're looking directly at the camera, aren't you? Yeah, she's more like, "Where's your baby? Get out of my face! <laughs> like you're old and dusty. <laughs> Don't want you. <laughs> I already raised you. Show Where's me the baby? child." Uh, all right, so this is amazing, Zach, Richard. In, enjoy. It's just so weird. I just flip it on and off randomly during meetings and uh, <laughs> during this call. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, no, but I, we came into a meeting last week, uh, and Viren, our video producer, he was on, and I forgot that I had turned it on the first day that it came out. And we were talking for about 10 minutes, and I don't know, he must have thought I was losing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> because, like, I'm just talking to him, and I wasn't looking at the video preview, so I didn't realize it was on until until a, a while in, and he was like, I was, I was going to say something, but... <laughs> Yeah. Who doesn't have an entire meeting staring only directly <laughs> into their webcam? I do it all the time, actually. I, think it's I was really like, fun. you're really, really good at it. Like, annoyingly oh, yeah. so. I like mugging directly into the webcam. Yeah. I'm doing it right now. So all am right. I. That's enough talking about this. It's so creepy. But it's out. You should go play with it if you have an NVIDIA card. The fact that you can pipe any source through it, I think, is deeply hilarious. But I would expect, again, it's in FaceTime. It's in a bunch of laptops. I would bet the next generation of like Apple laptops has it because they already have the technology and they're using the same chips, which brings me to the chips. Do you see that segment? Oh, I like that. That was good. I did it. I loved it. It was perfect. Smooth. All right. So, Monica, you have been reviewing the new MacBook Pro 16s with the M2 Pro, the M2 Max. Chris Welch reviewed the Mac Mini, which is the same chip, the same computer, a little <laughs> but case little. without a battery and a screen. What's going on here? So the MacBook Pro 16 looks very similar, identical even, to the 2021 MacBook Pro 16. But the chip inside is called the M2 instead of the M1. There's the M2 Max and the M2 Pro, which is not the M1 Max and the M1 Pro. It's the, you know, it's the two. Yeah. It's the second one. It's dos. Yeah, dos. <laughs> um, is it any good? Yeah. So, um, so it... For the workload that I do, which is, you know, lots of Google Docs and mm-hmm. lots of spreadsheets and lots of Zoom calls, it's, like, not a noticeable difference. It's not um, – that's not it, that's not anything that it impacts. 
it is a an upgrade in graphic performance and an upgrade in CPU performance. And it is something that you will notice if you are doing heavier professional workloads. We saw decreases in export time. We saw decreases in Xcode time. Um, benchmarks across the board were higher. So it is a more powerful laptop. The battery life is a lot longer. And I think to me, that's the most significant part. Um, it, is it the same battery as last time, like the same size battery? It is the same 100 watt hour battery. So that is like super impressive. Then. Well, the chip is more efficient. Um, there are two more cores on the M2 Max than there were on the M1 Max. They're both efficiency cores. Um, it, it seems like a more efficient chip. I would usually get around 10 hours out of the M1 Max. I'm getting, depending on my workload, I'll get 16 to 20. Wow. It's crazy. a very big difference for me. That doesn't mean everyone will see that same difference. You know, people's workloads vary, people's usage habits vary, but I will be very surprised if any if anyone didn't see a couple more hours at least of battery out of this machine than out of the older one, which doesn't mean, I don't think anyone's necessarily trying to upgrade from the M1, that would surprise me. But like, if you're thinking of doing that, you don't need to do that. The M1 Pro and M1 Max are fine. But these are, for people who are still upgrading from Intel machines, these are big increases in power and they're more efficient. I mean, that's like six to eight hours extra battery though. Like, Neelai, do you have some FOMO about your M1? So I'm, I'm staring at my M1 Pro, Yeah. 16 inch Macro Pro. It's still the best laptop I've ever owned. Uh huh. And we have, an M2 Pro, 16-inch MacBook Pro. We have yet to run benchmarks on it, and but we run the benchmarks on the, on the Mini with that. Chip. Yeah, and it's like it's a linear increase in performance and a linear increase in battery life. It's just like these numbers are better. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> in sort of exactly the way that you would expect them to be, which is kind of interesting. It somewhat has the vibes of like an Intel, a pre AMD being a competitor Intel upgrade. It's like. They made the chips better. They didn't feel like they had to make a giant splash with the chips, which is fine because the last ones that came out were a giant splash. So yes, real for... TikTok kind of situation. Right, this and is the, the rumors talk. are that M3s will be on a three nanometer process, right? right? And that's yeah. like that's like yeah. straight up. That's just straight up Intel TikTok. And that TikTok. is the pattern yeah. that we saw from Intel pre before AMD sort of burst on the scene as you know making. We often had. Less exciting generations followed by more exciting generations. It was super fun to write about those, too. Because you'd <laughs> yeah. be like, this year they're 10% faster. Anything <laughs> cool? I said 10% faster. <laughs> That's all you need. Be excited. The number is 10. What more do you want? <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't... I, this computer already has... The M1 Pro, 16-inch mm -hmm. MacBook Pro, same battery, 100 kilowatt hour battery, which is like... it's I think it's actually like 99 point something to like sneak under the... Yeah, yeah. under the plane um, limit. But like this computer, I just like never plug it. I haven't plugged it in all day today. Yeah, I mean, do we go to the only the only way I'm getting that 16 hour figure is I do not let it go to sleep and I have it run something constantly. If I were just using this in my day to day life, I would not need to. Plug yeah, it you in would just every couple days. That's incredible. Now, I didn't get that from the M1 Max when we tested the M1 right. Max. So if I was like, I'm always on the road rendering, mm -hmm. road renderers, <laughs> as you do. Sure. Yeah, who is it? Just driving with one hand <laughs> just over here. Constantly, <laughs> just mobile Compiling rendering. your Xcode, yeah. Uh, I, maybe. Like, I, honestly, maybe. I'd be like, you know what? It, it It's more power yeah. and more battery life. And my mobile rendering workflow <laughs> will be significantly improved. The thing that really struck me reading your review is that it runs the fan and is like a noisier computer. It was much noisier. I was using, I was running like Puget Bench in the office and like, People were a couple desks over, and they were coming over like, what is going on over here? Like that. That's correct. That I can't remember the last time we had a noisy Mac. Yeah. So that is, and I mean, you know, that was it running on high power mode, which, like, if you don't run on high power mode, you probably will not get that much noise. You probably will get decreased performance. Is but, high power mode, like, a thing you have to activate? Yeah. So if you go into the, the, the battery profiles, you can put on silent mode. You can put it on high power mode. You can put it on automatic, which decides which one to use based on what you're doing. Which did you do for your battery test? The, 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 the battery one. <laughs> I love that. Okay, yeah. so like high power mode, super loud, but also like balls to the wall perform performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there was when I when I ran benchmarks while I was in the in the um, in the battery mode, they were there was substantially decreased performance. So, so you want to have high power mode on if you're doing load. Mobile rendering. Yeah, okay. mobile but you won't be stealthy. Like yeah, you won't be stealthy. Everybody's going to hear you. Come. I mean, like given the truck you drive, everybody yeah. was hearing you coming It was very, anyway. like, I, I, the, the 
area behind the keyboard was like very hot, which like yeah. I've never seen from one of these MacBooks before. Well, that's interesting though, because that means like so these these are thermally limit limited. Like that's where where the slowdown is on well, these. So, Actually, I think this is like kind of a weird moment for Apple, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have been very aggressive, thermally limiting their machines for quite a while. Yeah. Like the Intel MacBook Airs were like thermally throttling all over the place. The first generation M1 Air in the old case design was throttled all, like it would hit its limit and throttle down all the time. Yeah. And the M1 13 inch MacBook Pro would be like, I'm going to run the fan across the (laughs) water. And it was like a pretty quiet fan. This one seems like the first time Apple's like, you know what? It's going to get hot and noisy, and we're going to keep that performance envelope up. Yeah. And yeah. I will just be clear, like, that was only, that was when it was running Puget Bench, which does just, like, the wildest things. Like, it's throwing effects. It's doing all this random stuff with 4K and 8K. Like, if I'm just, like, doing my, like, regular, like, if I'm watching Better Call Saul or whatever, it's not... Like, I'm not too extreme. It's not like either it's gonna melt down or we're gonna watch the superior prequels. Exactly, those are the only two things that you could would ever do a MacBook. I'm just coming out and saying it. Is it, it is a it is not we're not back in 13 inch Intel MacBook Pro land where mm-hmm. like I open one Chrome tab and it fries itself to death. Like, yeah. this is still that that's not gonna happen if you're just like doing Chrome or whatever. That was when it was running like the most intense thing that I ran on it. The other thing that really struck me at the review is you pointed out that, uh, apart from battery life, where Apple is still just like way ahead of everybody, performance-wise, Intel is making some products that can compete. It, yeah. So this year, um, we just went. We just came back from CES. AMD and Intel both announced these just absolutely wild chips. There's like Intel's got 24 cores. Uh, AMD has a 16 core chip, and that's not a big little one. That's like a full 16 power cores. These, I would expect these chips to be competitive with Apple on like Cinebench scores. In, so we are in a very different landscape from the landscape we were in when the M1 Max came out where Intel was just not even holding a candle to its performance. Where we do not expect Intel and AMD to compete is battery life. And I don't, I don't make pronouncements before I've tested the chips, but when I was talking to Jason Banta from AMD at CES, he was telling me basically like, yeah, we're not targeting an audience that cares about battery life with this, like, this They is, don't care this about is, it. This is really That's one way to describe people who it. don't sure. unplug their laptop. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 those weren't the exact words, but that was the sentiment I got from, you know, talking to a number of different um, uh, people who were involved in the making of that stuff. Richard, what were you saying? I said that that's one way to describe it. Um, and the other thing that I noticed, the gaming performance is noticeably better. We've got a lot more GPU power here, and it, it seems like if you want to use your MacBook Pro to play games, you can right. do that better. I don't do that. I don't recommend doing that. But <laughs> if you want to do it, I just need to caveat that. But if you want to buy a MacBook Pro and play a ton of games on it, we saw around a 20% increase in, ga- in graphic performance. And that you know that's noticeably better yeah. gaming experience. It just means like game developers have to actually develop for the Mac. And we're seeing like- We're seeing more of that. Apple, yes. Apple is courting these developers. These developers are starting to seem a little more interested. There's more you can play now than you could a couple of years ago, this but it's still- It's a low bar. It's a, yeah, it's the, the lowest the bar. bar. <laughs> the bar is on the floor, but it's, it's, going, it's going up. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like bit. this- and I, I hate to make this comparison for all kinds of reasons, but if I had to make a comparison, I think it's so it, it, it's competitive with the RTX 3070. Um, okay. And oh my God, they're coming over the walls with pitchforks. They're right? coming <laughs> with pitchforks. I only say that to sort of put it the cat the way you can think about it, sort of the way you can classify it is like that is the kind of if if you are thinking about like what kind of power do I need? If that is the kind of pa- graphic power you are looking for, this is the computer that will give you that. Cool. <laughs> Which doesn't mean doesn't mean doesn't mean buy it to play games. <laughs> and and you also can't do creepy staring down the camera lens with your Apple well, laptop. Well, apparently you can do it on FaceTime. Uh, except for on FaceTime. No, you can do that. I don't. Can you? Hold on. No, is that only on the phone? Oh, I'm not running the latest version of Mac OS. I, it might only be on the phone. This okay. is going to make for both horrible video and audio. Yeah, Let's we're going to worry about it. Um, the other thing that caught me was uh, basically the only other change here is an HDMI spec change. 2.1. I mean, I mean, what show is this? We, we need to talk <laughs> about the HDMI spec change for the next hour. <laughs> <laughs> Max does HDMI it, CEC. It, this is something I hadn't thought about, but I just learned last week. It's such a strange emission, it feels like. Yeah, because they don't do CEC, so you cannot, like... 
a Mac right now is not a recommended product for your home theater system. And it used to be 20 years ago when the Mac I'm, Mini first I'm, came I'm out. I'm sorry. What kind of piracy situation do you need a Mac in your home theater for? You know what? Sometimes you just need to acquire things from the internet and you don't want to like then transfer them over. You just want it fast. Can I can I tell a very tangential story? You you know the story. Alex yeah. actually is part of the story. Oh. So I'm off Twitter. I gotta fill the time. Yeah. <laughs> There's hours to reclaim now that the Twitter is not on my phone. And yes, I look at Twitter on the desktop every now and again. Sometimes I might send a tweet and then five hundred people tweet me like, I thought you quit Twitter. And it's it's like, great. Uh, anyway, not on my phone. So I'm trying all these new things. I'm trying not to immediately fill it with more feeds. Yeah. Right? You're not trying to quit cigarettes and immediately pick up nicotine gum. You're like, I'm trying to I'm trying to rewire the brain. So this last week, Apple News, because I pay for Apple One. I get the, did you know there's a magazine I read when I was a kid called <laughs> Stereo Review. It is now turned into a magazine <laughs> called Sound Division. They do not publish in the Apple News format. They publish... As just PDFs yeah. of a print magazine, which is like Getting super fun source. to read. I like it. It's, yeah. it's good, man. Like reading a giant PDF magazine on an iPad is like, maybe Steve Jobs is on something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, full page print ad for Samsung HDR10 in this last. It's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful. But they had letters to the editor about the Kaleidoscape, which is like a $5,000, $8,000 yeah. lossless audio, high bit rate streaming thing. Like, the be- it's the best of the, the hi- best. Highest quality digital video player. The people who own this also have, like, home theater systems that you know, cost $50,000. They custom tag all the movies yes. to trigger home automation points as you're watching them. Oh, my so God. So when the credits come on, you can trigger the lights to come on in your house. I need to own this. I want this. So- like, we yeah. end up losing as <laughs> this is um, so like read and like reading a letter to the editor about it, and like the last line is, "I'm incarcerated, and this is how I keep up with news." <laughs> okay. And it's like, well, first Alex immediately Google. googles, <laughs> so we can't figure out who it is. I'm just telling you, no matter where you go, <laughs> the AV nerds are like, I they're need there. To know. They need Alex's to know. People are everywhere. We're and everywhere. Now I feel bad that I'm like, who has a Mac Mini in their home theater setup? Because it's the guy in jail writing yeah. studio review. <laughs> He's like he's got like the little clear Mac Mini. They've taken all that out so you can see the inside. He's ready. He's got a sick system in there. Anyway, if anybody has a Kaleidoscape, please please let me know. And I desperately want to know how you've coded your home automation to trigger with the custom oh triggers in the movie files. I'm just thinking thing of like sounds amazing. thinking like Panic Room, and then all of the window shades come down when they go into the room. And you're like, oh, it's so yeah. immersive. <laughs> Um, 3DX. I read, I read the actual review in the middle of it. They're like, Fast and Furious 7 looks great on the clock. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. Like, it's all the same in the end. All, right, all I had to do to start this conversation was mention HDMI CC. And there we go. <laughs> I told you what show it is. So the only reason that you, ha- you really need 2.1 is 8K, mm-hmm. which you can support. Great. But then it's really 144 hertz refresh rates, yeah. which is only for gaming. Yeah. Which, I mean... You know, if you bump the settings way down on Tomb Raider, you can maybe get there. Wait, so you can't, you don't think you can, you, you can't run 4K 144 on this thing? We got, at 1920 by 1200, we got, I think, 103 okay. FPS. Did you, what what game was it? Tomb Raider. So you didn't run nice something settings. like a, the classic Civilization 4? Oh, I bet that would have gotten 144. I, I mean, I'm sure there are like a mostly <laughs> static. Game. Open up SimCity, reticulate those splines, man. Yeah. I'm sure there are games where, you, where I mean, you can find a game where you, where you'll get that if you're if you really want to do esports on your MacBook Pro 16 with M1 Max and that M2 Max. I feel like you'll just your, get your choice. bullied if you try to do esports on a Mac. I mean, I would bully you. Yeah, like I would <laughs> bully you. <laughs> like, why did you spend that much on your just esports? <laughs> <laughs> just at, the, at, at minimum, yeah. that's just such a waste of your money. All right, so these feel like solid incremental upgrades. Right? Yeah, I mean, and I, you know, the, the incremental upgrade is like a hot button word to use. I don't say that to mean that this is like an inadequate upgrade or a boring upgrade or like objectionable. Incremental in the sense that. You know, it's around a twenty percent CPU uplift and a ten to fifteen ish percent single uh, single core uplift, and a lot more battery. I mean, I, I like I think we're we're kind of yeah. discounting the battery and life here because that's a lot of battery life. What the battery life in the M2 Pro is? I'm I have the whole weekend blocked out. We're gonna see if <laughs> I can run it down. In I've canceled yeah, last plans. Time it took you the whole it took, weekend. It was agonizing. 
I, I've canceled plans. We are going to sit down. We are going to run. We are going to edit on it till it dies. Um, but yeah, it, 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 I don't mean to say it's unexciting. It's it's exciting to see um, that you know these are increasing how quickly people can do their work, and they're increasing you know the number of things they can cram into a work day. The most exciting upgrade for me is the battery life, mm-hmm. um, and that is what the, it would make biggest difference in you know the workload for someone like me but that also goes to show somewhat that i'm not really the target audience for this yeah this kind of device you're not the stealthy mobile render ninja <laughs> no i'm not <laughs> uh, maybe for my esports no no you you, but yeah. you you are a person who might work an entire day on your laptop you've been in different places you've moved from location to location you didn't plug it in you went to sleep you didn't plug it in you wake up you have something you need to do and you can't yeah. wait and you're on the movie i can't can keep it, it right again, by my head yeah and it'll be fine yeah, that's yeah. Can we do a challenge for you guys when you go to WWDC where you just take a 16 inch Mac Pro and don't charge it the entire time you're there? No, because we have to get our work done. That is, <laughs> that is the environment where we actually end up killing the batteries because yeah. you're in a really RF constrained environment. Mm-hmm. So your Wi Fi radio is like hunting a lot. Yeah. And that's actually bizarrely the thing that always ends up killing. Oh, interesting. The um, um, yeah, the other thing, um, and I'm in this review, I actually am almost as excited to see what kinds of discounts we see on the M1 Pro and M1 Max because if those laptops go below $2,000 I'm going to have I I can't say this for sure <laughs> I would not be surprised if I have a real hard time recommending any 15 or 16 inch laptop that's not those because yeah. that is just going to be such a like wildly good buy <laughs> for, for, for a lower price than this yeah I, I'm actually, I feel the same way about the um, Mac Minis. Yeah. Right? Like, if this generation of Mac Minis ever sees a discount with the M2 Pro in it. Just instant. Like, right now, it's like sitting at yeah. 600 bucks, 599 Yeah. If that thing get, dips anywhere below 5 <laughs> it's like, ugh. So 550 no. Five, no, it's 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 like four ninety nine ninety nine. I'm like, I'm yeah, like yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, 450 I'm, done. You just didn't yeah. even think. Because I mean, it's, it's it's the longevity of that machine, given its performance envelope. Yeah. For the things you want to do with a Mac Mini, you're like, I'm gonna have this computer for 15 years. But you won't right. be able to put it in your home theater system. You will not. Be able to. <laughs> That's how you get a Kaleidoscape. <laughs> <laughs> Just spend the eight. If the Kaleidoscape people are listening, which I, I'm sure they are. Yes, a hundred percent. The first time we've ever mentioned this product on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. They're like sitting up right now. Send send Alex a Kaleidoscape. <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to I want to try one out. Please, yeah. Yeah. for free. Uh, it's, it's a client server system. Yeah. So if you just buy the client, you still can't do anything. <laughs> you have to buy a separate, like, 64 gigabyte server. Huge servers. And I was trying to price them out, but it's one of those websites where you go and they, they're like, call us for a quote. Yeah. And I was like, oh, boy. It's good. It's good. Never mind. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the elephant in the room when you're reviewing something like this and, you know, sort of the, the caveat you have to make when you say anything good about it is, like, these are really expensive. Like, they're really great. There are lots of great things about them. The cheapest M2 Max unit is, like, over $3,000. It is a really inaccessible laptop for many, many people. But, so, so I'm sort of still, I'm still, you know, I think it's great. I still see it as kind of a niche purchase because it is in that high price point. The M1 Max and the M1 Pro are moving. It, it the more around. discounted they are, the much closer they are to being like very accessible mainstream purchases, or sorry, certainly more so than uh, the M2 devices. I, again, I, that M1 Max, I, I felt like didn't quite have the best. It had the performance, mm-hmm. but most people don't need it Yeah, because it's mostly like extra GPU performance, right? Yeah. Um, and like, what are you going to do, play games on this thing? <laughs> Yes, um, Alex. Crusader <laughs> Kings Three. Alex is gonna play Civ Four. Uh, it's the M1 Pro if it comes down. Then, like that thing is, it's in such a sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my device is usually, and I, I think that based on we we haven't gone to fully benchmark and break down the M2 Pro laptop yet. We do have the M2 Pro Mac Mini, so we have a sense of how that's going to perform. Um, we'll have more updates next week about how the laptop specifically compare. But based on what we are seeing so far, I imagine it's going to be a similar situation where the M2 Pro is more of the everyone chip. Like, that's what you can get if you, you know, are doing this stuff occasionally. Like, th- this stuff being, like, video stuff, Xcode, re- the rendering that Neil is doing all the time. Constantly. If you are buying this laptop... In your car. <laughs> right. I'm rendering bitcoins on the go. <laughs> right. If you are buying this primarily to do a graphic 
incredibly intensive task, then it be M2 Max, you'll have a better time. It will save you, you know, if your job requires you to do all this stuff really fast, the M2 Max will save you time. But it is not, the, the increase is not such that it is super, super necessary for like the average buyer to have it. Yeah. All right. We got to take a break. Monica, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. We'll have more after Monica's marathon <laughs> M2 Pro battery <laughs> testing session. <laughs> We'll Please see. Just be He's gonna come out the other side like a skeleton. I'll be just a zombie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll have more. We'll have updates on that. Uh, we gotta take a break. We'll be right back. We're gonna talk about trouble. Okay. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. It's time to talk about trouble in Alphabet City. Big which, trouble in Alphabet City. Which is a real neighborhood here in New York City. Yeah. But but this is this is a different like alphabet. You, like, to normal people, if you say there's trouble in Alphabet City, they'll be. Like, what, did a trust fund baby run <laughs> over a car? Like, <laughs> yes. Did someone not get into the club? Uh, that's, not, that's not what's happening here. No. It's way less fun. Yeah. Uh, so lots of Google News this week. Uh, they laid off 12,000 people mm -hmm. on Friday. First mass layoffs in Google history. Major culture change for Google. They've never done it before. Larry Page, Sergey Brin, back at the company to talk it over with Sundar. Yeah. And obviously, they're the founders in control. They, they, no one knows where they've been for years. <laughs> like, Sergey is just like out. Just like part, Came like, back from the, the yeah. Larry's trying to fly a taxi. <laughs> he like, landed it. Larry in. Page has like five flying car startups. <laughs> he, I think it's down to like three or maybe two now. But you know, we'll see. Oh, it's just two. All right. Okay. Uh, but they're back in the building at Google because they got to refocus. Big New York Times story about Google calling it Code Red over mm -hmm. Chat GPT. We can get all to that. They left twelve thousand people, seemingly at random. I'm right. sure that you know they, they, there are reports that they had hundreds of executives make, like all together to make sure they made the right decisions. Um, but you know, very senior people who've been at Google for eight, ten, twelve years, clipped very junior people who actually like you know it's a twelve thousand people, a lot of people. Yeah. So, like, I've seen TikToks from Google employees who are like, I just walked, walked out of a client meeting. <laughs> Whoops. Woo. You know? Um, and they're not done yet because they're all over the world. Mm -hmm. Lots of legal regulations, lots of different countries. So that's just the top line. And Liz actually has a great piece today about the layoffs across tech because Amazon had layoffs, Stripe had layoffs, Microsoft had layoffs, just down the line. And they all have the same reason. <laughs> Spotify had layoffs. Yeah. Which is we thought the changes brought about by the pandemic – would would stay. Which is, everybody really sat there and was like, we thought everybody sitting in their houses, baking bread and crying about missing the outdoors would just be the, the present forever. Yeah. Like, we're all going to shop online. We're going to watch all of our videos on YouTube and Netflix. We're going to listen to everything on Spotify. Yeah. Do Clubhouse. Do you remember when the tech industry tried to convince us Clubhouse was real? And, like, I talk for a living. And I was like, y'all, uh-uh. Everybody's like, well, we got spaces now, though. <laughs> we got spaces out of it. They thought, that, they thought that we were going to be buying brand new electronics and new laptops every six months for the next 25 years. <laughs> yeah. Logitech and it was like, webcams are back. I, you know, I, I'm trying to keep Logitech in business, but I can only buy so many racing wheels. <laughs> like, I have to put them somewhere at some point. <laughs> and stare directly down the camera. <laughs> racing wheel. Um, Logitech had bad earnings this, mm -hmm. this quarter. So this is the context, right? They're all blaming it on, we thought the pandemic trends would stay where they were. How could we know? It, it seems a little short-sighted. Yeah. Like, when Liz is writing this piece, she's like, what do you think? I was like, the first sentence is, they didn't think we would go back outside. <laughs> and so, I like, we can talk about why the layoffs are happening and all, all this stuff. But, like, that's the reason that the tech companies are giving. Mm -hmm. And we talked about it on this show. I talked about it in Decoder. Like, what are the first order changes of the pandemic? What are the second order changes? Like remote work is a lasting right. second order change. Like a real thing on, um, I go on CNBC a lot. All cable news is like, screw it, you can be on Zoom now. They used to be like, you have to come in. Yeah. School has changed. We don't have snow days anymore. I was just talking to my sister about my, my nephew. They had a snow day, but it was not a snow day. It was just a go to school at home day. Oh, that's, that's that should be illegal. I don't. Yeah. I don't know and if there's anyone we can. Call little kids tomorrow. unionize right now. <laughs> exactly. The little kids union. Uh, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, so there, there's that stuff. But the top line of all these layoffs yeah. is we thought it was permanent, and that just seems so mistaken. And I think for Google especially, 
it just rings really hollow to me. Yes. Especially when you compare it to Apple, who's notably not had layoffs and also didn't grow at nearly the same pace as these other companies. These other companies were doing 60, 70 percent growth uh, year over year for like their staff. And Apple was like 10, 20 percent. And so, yeah, now these companies are going, oh, we need all that money back. Never mind. Give it back. Yeah, and, they're, and they're apart from Meta, which Mark Zuckerberg said the same thing. We have, saw this acceleration of the pandemic, and now we got to wind it back. OK. Um, but, you know, Google, they left their AI divisions alone, but they shut down their incubator, which does all their 20 percent time mm-hmm. projects. They're shutting down all these, like, weird other bets they're doing. Mm-hmm. Their, like, health science division of Alphabet. Like, they're trying to refocus on the core of Google. I think a lot of people have learned from Elon. <laughs> like, I just get rid of, like, most of the company. And, like, yeah, it'll be a little crappier, but... It, it can kind of... It, it still goes. It's going to crash. Like, <laughs> and, and, and we have yet to see. Um, so that's, like, the big context for Google, right? They just had this, like, very traumatic event. Yeah. And, like, maybe the whole tech industry is just copycatting each other. Liz has great quotes in her piece. Like, a management professor at Stanford is like, everyone's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, he's like, it's morons being morons. What do you want from this? Um, it's very good. So, but that's a broader context. But then specifically Google. Mm-hmm. Right? You look at all the other companies. Amazon, it's like, oh, maybe they built too much warehouse capacity. They're laying people off. Microsoft, they like shut down HoloLens and a bunch of weird Surface stuff that people weren't going to buy. PC shipments are down because the pandemic is over. And everyone already bought their new PC. It's still Microsoft. They're going to be fine. Yeah. Google is like, oh, they did all of this. They fired 12,000 people. The government is suing them. We should talk about this ad tech lawsuit. Mm-hmm. The second big antitrust lawsuit against Google, which it's... It, we're a little not, biased here, but yeah. We're a little biased. <laughs> um, you know how I feel about the web. Uh, that's a big deal. And then they are on the run from chat GPT. We talked about this a little bit last week. Yeah. You just like add up this week for Google. And you're like, oh, this is the most like existential threats a company can face at the same time. Yeah, this is this is way different than like the Pixel comes out and does f- not great numbers. This is this is their core business is under attack from many different avenues. And like, I think the Chat GPT avenue is not actually the the big existential threat that they feel it is. But the stuff going on with the DOJ that feels really really big and important to me potentially, much more so than the Chat GPT. But that feels like more of a a crisis of like what are we as a company. Yeah, Richard, and all of these things are happening at once. It, it's just something that we really have never seen for Google, like since it came on the scene. That we that they've had all of this, a real comp- competitor that maybe they aren't ready for in a, in a space that they aren't ready for. The pressures of regulators are pre- higher than they've ever been because everyone has a reason to take take a hammer to big tech. It's just a way that you can score points as a politician, as you pointed out many times, Eli. And I don't know. I, I can't. I can't remember a time since Google has existed that we've seen them on the back foot like this. Yeah, it's tough. And I, my, you know, my theory about Google is people don't take it seriously because it's called Google. <laughs> like it's, it's hard to see the company for what it is. Yeah. Because it's called Google, and it, it you know, it very and for a good reason. It maintains this image of being like a goofball place for smart people to do smart. Well, stuff. Well, I worked really hard on that whole do no evil. Thing which they've gotten rid of. Yeah, it's gone. They had um, a movie about working. They made a movie about getting jobs at Google, like a, t- a, movie a with real Hollywood oh, yeah. stars. And it's an advertising company. Like, and for some reason we don't think of it that way. It's very strange. Well, you know, it's funny. Like big advertising companies, they love to think of themselves as like creative, progressive shops, and then at the end of the day, they're like selling you cigarettes and booze. Yeah. Like, fine. Um, Google is an advertising company, but they're like an ad tech company. And so this is what this lawsuit really gets at, is most of what we as consumers experience of Google are the products, in particular the two, Search and YouTube, Mm -hmm. Gmail. Um, Great. And they're good products. People like them. They're the industry leader. It's very hard to compete with Google Search in particular. But the other side of Google, the business of Google, is as ruthlessly competitive as any company. Yeah. Yeah. And it's run by advertising executives and salespeople and money people. And they are not shy. And so they are not shy about winning whatever competition they're in or foreclosing competition or protecting their monopoly. So you see this lawsuit. It's 194 pages long. It's fun to read in the sense that 
any lawsuit that explains what ad tech is and how it works. I love it. To, I, I read it. Uh, I, I recommend you go read the complaint. It's just the complaint. It's a bunch of allegations, but you know, uh, they have obviously done a bunch of discovery. They have a lot of quotes from executives. And what you find is that when you load a web page, when you load one of our web pages or the Times web page or any publisher, any website really that has ads on it, mm -hmm. there's a whole stack of technology. It's called the ad tech stack. And there's lots of components. And at every layer of the stack, Google owns either the one or two product. And they make it so that all those products work better together. And they charge more money that Google then skims off at another layer of the stack. I love and they it. have ruthlessly operated this system to basically be the winner. There's no way to compete with them. Yeah. And all this other stuff that Google has done in the past, like Google AMP, uh, Google Discover, like this, these products that Google makes, they use them to force people back into their advertising ecosystem. The yeah. funnel. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like a ruthless money machine. Yeah. And so if you just like to abstract it, the way to think about it is Apple's revenue platform that we've complained about many times mm -hmm. is the iPhone and the App Store. Right. Right. And at, at the end of the day, Tim Cook's goal is that every time you push any button on your phone, he gets he get, money. He gets money. And you can just see that they ruthlessly optimize for that. And people can argue about whether that's good or that's bad. You can have antitrust lawsuits or laws in Congress or the Europeans can mad at you. But, like, that's the goal. And you can see how they get there. Yeah. You can see that, you know, Amazon's revenue platform is its store and its AWS business. And their goal is to get you to buy everything from Amazon and for every app to use AWS and cloud service provider. You can do this with Microsoft, too. You can do this with all these companies. Google's revenue platform is the web. Yeah. And so it's hard to see where it begins and ends because you're not... It's so ubiquitous. It's just everywhere. And so everywhere. you forget. So you forget that all these ads are being served to you by Google, in particular by a company Google acquired called DoubleClick. Mm -hmm. And they run this product called DFP, DoubleClick for Publishers, with a change to Google Ads Manager, ever still calls it DFP. Uh, and that's, that thing that they own, the ad server, is like hard-coded to prefer Google's ad exchanges. Mm -hmm. It's hard, and that is hard-coded to prefer Google's uh, like demand side platform. These are all just like ad tech words. Whatever, it's just like everywhere you go, the whole chain is Google. Mm -hmm. And so the government's case against Google is you bought up all the competitors at every layer of the stack. You used your dominance in one layer of the stack to achieve dominance in another layer of the stack. And now you're charging higher prices, which, Every other time we talk about antitrust, we're like, we got to change this thing from the consumer welfare theory where there's no higher prices because everything's free, right? Da, da, da. We got to like invent this new, this is just like old school, yeah. 1980s, Ronald Reagan, Robert Bork <laughs> antitrust. It's like, oh, you bought all this shit and now the prices went up. And so like maybe they got like, you know, usually every time there's a lawsuit, Amazon's like, but people love Amazon Prime. <laughs> Like, you know, like <laughs> Apple's like, the App Store made everyone happier today. Everybody loves Netflix. This is like a bunch of advertisers like, you you robbed us. Yeah. And like Google's, Google can't be like, people love web advertising. <laughs> like they're that's in a hard, That's a much harder which, case to make. Yeah. And so like I just see this as it's not a novel legal theory. It's not some like Lena Khan invention. Yeah. It's a class. The people who want the lawsuit are the media. Mm-hmm advertising companies, other e-commerce companies. Like, they all see it that, oh, we're losing revenue, we're losing profit margin into Google. There's real money at stake. And this is Google's bit, like, this is the money. Yeah. Right? If you, if you uncouple the web from Google, I'm not sure what the web looks like. Duck, duck, go. <laughs> like, if people are doing SEO spam for duck, duck, go, like, <laughs> You found it like the nichest of niche interests. <laughs> You've got three customers. Like, here's what I do. I cosplay as a specific Victorian <laughs> lord, and I do SEO for DuckDuckGo. What are you doing? Well, <laughs> what we're going to do, we're going to rebuild Ask Jeeves. It's, but it's just going to be real people. It's just, just going to be a guy. You're just going to ask a guy. Yeah. And he's going he's gonna to tell you something. And similar to AI, it may or may not be true, but you'll get a response. Yeah, you think chat GPT is just a, a bunch of cosplayers? Definitely. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, so th this to me, it's like you just add this up. It's on the one hand, and I, I don't think this is true at all, but people will, are out there mm -hmm. freaking out the stock market by saying chat GPT is going to replace Google. Yeah. 
And it's like, <laughs> mostly what you experience with ChatGPT is the good stuff. Like, if you actually sit around trying to use ChatGPT, you're like, this thing's, this thing's like not very good. Yeah. It's very impressive. But you're seeing it filtered through millions it's really of people only showing you the best stuff. Resource intensive and expensive to use. Uh, yeah. By the way, we got it wrong in the show. Um, in classic TikTok strategy, we published oh. the thing we said wrong, and that is our most viewed. TikTok. Yes. That's all for you guys. We Misinformation. Got you. <laughs> we got you. <laughs> <laughs> you clicked, didn't you? Uh, no, we got it wrong. We were getting it wrong. It's, uh, it's on Azure. Okay. Microsoft obviously has huge investment, open eye. They just made a bigger investment. Uh, it, uh, Sam Altman, CEO, okay. says it is not very expensive to run. Oh, uh, interesting. Cheaper. It is not as cheap as Google Search is right. per query. It's still like more resource it's intensive. It's more resource intensive than Google Search. But you see Microsoft is like, oh, we don't have to do Bing. We can just answer the questions directly with chat GPT. <laughs> All right, maybe that's right. Uh, BuzzFeed today announced that it's going to start having ChatGPT write the quizzes. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mia has done a lot of great reporting on our competitor, CNET, uh, which... Uh, but I have very bittersweet feelings with this. CNET has been the thing that we have competed against. They're our enemy. Since we are founding, right? Yeah. We're like, we got to beat CNET. They're like the bastion. And they got bought by this private equity company. And now they're like, publish SEO spam <laughs> written by robots. Because <laughs> they are flooding Google to try to win searches and then put ads on those pages. The ads are served by Google. Yeah, basically, like, they're just chasing Google. When I say I don't know what the shape of the web is without Google, it's you... You can, CNET's ownership can be like, everybody automates their mortgage rate stories. What they have not accounted for is why does CNET publish mortgage, mortgage <laughs> rate stories? And the answer is because they want to win the Google searches. Yeah. So that when you buy a mortgage, you've come through their affiliate link and they get a huge cut of that. Do you know um, when you sign up for a credit card on, like the points guy is great. When you sign up for a credit card, it's all a lot of money. Company. It's like almost $900 to sign up. In an affiliate rank. By the way, we are going to start recommending credit cards. <laughs> and mortgages. Um, Sign just, up with us. You just look at that system. Yeah. And you're like, on the one hand, people think, whether or not it's true, that it will be disrupted by AI chatbot technology, and Microsoft is making that investment. And Google cannot replace, like, regulators around the world will destroy Google if Google stops sending traffic to people, scrapes their data into a language model, and then starts answering the questions directly. Yeah. I just, I just don't think that's going to go well for them. Well, I think everybody would just also probably frantically start delisting and being all in on DuckDuckGo. <laughs> Alex is the new CEO of DuckDuckGo. Right? Um, Please invest. <laughs> Directly to be Venmo. Uh, and then on the flip, and then on the flip side, the AI is being used to flood the search results with garbage. Mm -hmm. Right. So like Google is in like a war of attrition against SEO spammers who now have an even cheaper way. Yeah. Of filling out their content farms. And then the government's like, also, your money is evil. And we want to, and oh, that forgot to say this. The government is asking to break up Google's ad yes. tech division. They want to spin off double click for publishers and AdX, which is their exchange. So, like, just imagine being like Sundar Pichai. <laughs> right? You're like, on the one hand, I've got to <coughs> kill the cash cow mm -hmm. and replace it with. The technology we developed, our own LLMs, Lambda and others, yeah. which are superior to ChatGPT, but we haven't released because we have ethical concerns about it. <laughs> Whoops. But our competitor, Microsoft, has no such problems. <laughs> They're just going to do it. Uh, meanwhile, our cash cow search is being turned into a worse product by these same ChatGPT-wielding SEO spammers. <laughs> oh, and the government wants to break us up. It's and it's... All kind of of Google's own making, too, yeah. right? Like, Google became so dominant, everybody is chasing to be on Google, seeking the fastest, easiest way to get a tiny piece of the pie that Google has made itself. Yeah. So, like, it's kind of its own fault. Yes. Yeah, so its like, success uh, is, like, what's brought it here, right? Yeah. I mean, this is a very smart company. I think Sonora's a great CEO. I, I think he's ruthless when he needs to be, and he's kind when he needs to be. He's very thoughtful. It's whatever. Like, he knows how to make money. We've interviewed him many times. Yeah. He is a very thoughtful and considered man. I just am like, his choice is effectively, all right, it's everyone on the web. Mm -hmm. It's governments around the world. <laughs> it's the Department of Justice. Who am I going to piss off? <laughs> right? Because, like, whatever move he makes <coughs> is going to piss off, like, two of those entities. Yeah. And I just think that is such a difficult place to be. So there, are, like I said, we, there's reporting out that, Google is called a code red about ChatGPT. They do have all this AI technology. They have um, 
uh, incepted this meme that Google invented the T in ChatGPT. It stands for transform. It's true. They've demoed it many times. Go back and watch any Google I.O. Like, there's a weird middle segment where Sundar is like, now I will talk to a fire hydrant as though it's a kitty. And it's like, I don't know what's going on, but, like, they, they can do it. Like, when they had everybody calling, you could just, like, ask for it to call and make a reservation for that, you? I don't think that's Is that not the same? Model. Okay. That's that's a different conversation. They've been demoing the the transformer large language models, mm-hmm. and like I think the last demo it was either this past year or the year before, he like asked Pluto if it was a planet. That's right. And Pluto was like, kind of sad. You know, <laughs> <It> was like, <laughs> well, well, I'll hear by myself. I don't really know what's going on. Um, but what they were demoing is effectively the same technology as ChatGPT. So they have it. Mm-hmm. They are not releasing it because it's they've thought until now it is unethical to let people talk to a robot that will confidently lie to them. Yes. And it, it is unethical. Microsoft. <laughs> Microsoft is like, whatever, man. <laughs> like, we lost at mobile. We lost on the web. We lost at search. We're, doing, we're, we're going to do something. Check right? out this lying robot. We <laughs> <laughs> With Bing. <laughs> but that's, that's the issue that they're running into now. So they're trying to launch all these AI products. They've got their search issues that you've laid out. But something that, that you've talked about a lot when we talk about these antitrust and these, these massive tech companies is that every single thing that they launch isn't big enough to really have any impact on their core product and all the money that it makes. So they can have all these, these new AI things. They can, you know, Sundar, he, he, can, he can do all of these things. They said they're going to launch matter. 20 None of them new will AI products what he has. this year. Yeah. The New York Times, the New York Times described all of these products that they are, are going to try to make. They're doing all the AI things that you've heard of that everyone else is doing. Maybe some that we haven't heard of. We're going to see them all at I.O. But none of them are bigger than advertising. Yeah. And and that's the thing that's under direct threat. And it's under the threat, again, in two different... No, it's under direct threat in three different ways, right? Yeah. The demand side of it, we talked about this last week, the demand side of it is people might search TikTok or ask ChatGPT or something else instead. Yeah. Or just search Reddit. The people do that all the time. The supply side that's of what it I do. is... Uh, Futurism, which has also done a great job reporting on the CET AI controversy, they had a great headline last week that's like, the SEO spammers are thrilled at Google's <laughs> non-response to CNET's AI issues. Like, and they're like in the dark web forums, and the SEO spammers are like, light it up, boys! Because like, that is a pure volume game for them, right? You mm-hmm. flood the internet with garbage content. You hope that people, you hope it ranks anywhere. You hope you collect some traffic. You show some garbage ads, and you take your pennies, and you just stack pennies until you've made dollars and if you can make web pages for nothing with an AI product yeah whew, you can stack those pennies pretty fast right and Google just like needs to have an answer to this and I don't think that they've arrived at one where they're like we will preserve the quality of Google search without irritating everyone or compete with chat GPT without irritating everyone and in the middle of it uh, to Richard's point the government's like you know the machine that makes money that you're trying to fix what if we took two thirds of it away and spun it off into different companies? And I just like I'm just like looking at this week for Google. I'm like, this is one of the most pivotal weeks. For one, of, like we talk about the, you know, this set of fan companies like every week. We're never like, man, Netflix is having an existential week. We're never, you know, like yeah. We're never like, oh, Apple could be five companies tomorrow. <laughs> like this is like one of the most consequential existential weeks for Google that I can think of for a big tech company in a like a long time we're potentially five years down the line we're looking at this week is like oh that was the beginning of a total re-architecting of the web yeah i do wonder i was you know i've been knocking on the chat gpt plan to like compete with it i wonder how much of that plan though is also to figure out how to combat it and and the spam it creates on google because like if you go and you create a new competitor for it and figure out all the inner workings you theoretically could like figure out how to highlight it and spot it. Uh, I think Casey and Platformer <coughs> spotlighted some of this, where he's mm-hmm. like, Google does have AI detection uh, systems. It can, it because it knows the training models, I'm sorry, because it knows the training data sets, it knows what it looks like on the other side. Mm-hmm. And it, there's this concept of like radioactive data, where you <laughs> seed the models with some stuff where you know what outputs it will generate and you can detect it even better. We'll see. I, I yeah. think we're in the middle of an arms race for Google. I love it. Uh, 12,000 is the first time the company's ever had layoffs in the scale. Never mind. I don't love it. Uh, yeah, I just think it's going to be weird. All right. We got to take a break. We come back. We talk about Tesla earnings. We got a little lightning round. Some Microsoft in there. We'll be right back. All right. We're back. 
I don't know why I thought we could get through Tesla and the lightning round in the last segment. Here. I believe in us. We're going to go really fast. <laughs> we're just going to accelerate it. Listen to us at 3x. So we're going to talk fast and they have to listen to us at 3x? <laughs> do a line of Coke first. <laughs> don't do a line of Coke. This is not an endorsement of cocaine. Sorry. I heard specifically, <laughs> I was told by an executive at this company that I had a, a job to do. And what else can I do? I, was the job doing cocaine? Okay. Who? Which exact? Was that? Was that not? Was that it's not? Fun. Was that not in your employment contract? Because. <laughs> Mine was very start, carefully negotiated. Our startup days are over. Sure. <laughs> there was a time. Yeah. Again, we're fine. this was the time when we were doing the video Vergecast. <laughs> the last time. Like I said, karmic debt, we are just immediately running up the bill again. Just, woo. We turn the cameras on. Alex is like, here's what you should do, kids. Because the whole line. <laughs> All right. We do have to get through this. Please uh, just don't tell your parents about that. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> It's bad. Just don't let them know any of that happened. <laughs> All right. Lots of Tesla. Tesla earnings. Elon's on trial for the 420. So for the 420 secured. tweet. Finally back. Uh, he is very upset about being on trial. Yeah. Uh, he's attacked the, the plaintiff. He's attacked the plaintiff's lawyer several times. Oof. Uh, the, it's a class action. It's a group of investors who feel that they lost money. Because Elon tweeted taking Tesla private at 420 a share, funding secured. Which was a thing that the SEC was also like, no. Yeah, the judge has instructed the jury in this case to uh, proceed knowing the tweet was a lie. <laughs> so like, Elon's on his back foot. And so he's in the courtroom, he's taking the stand, we've been covering it, but he's basically said to the plaintiff's lawyer, like, you don't represent my actual investors. Yeah. Uh, you're, just, you're just like a vulture. Which is very funny. The judge got mad at him. Mm -hmm. um, he said that he knows that he's popular because he has so many Twitter follow followers. Oh, buddy. That's tough. That's a tough one. Uh, just, I would say he's complained of back pain. Yeah. Uh, so just a very rough week. He did say one. the 420 week was, the 420 tweet was not about anything in particular as well. Oh, he said it wasn't, he said it wasn't a wee joke. He said it was a real number that was a 20% premium over the share price. Sure. Uh, for which, again, he was castigated by the judge because the judge was like, but the treat was a lie. <laughs> uh, it's a lot. So he's been on the stand. There's a lot of coverage there. Obviously, that, that trial is mostly mechanical about injury to these shareholders, but Elon's on a witness stand. We're not going to cover Yeah, we're going we're gonna to watch. Uh, so that's happening. At the same time, Tesla had earnings. Richard, earnings did pretty well. They actually made more money in 2022 than they ever did before. So there you go. It's yeah. amazing the way that we talk about the chaos, the way that his focus on Twitter may have taken away from Tesla or, or any a number of other things. Tesla is still making money. They are still making more cars than they than they did before. They are relying less on those credits that they sell to other companies for revenue. They are acting like an actual car company. Amazing. Building vehicles that people buy. Um, they, they showed off the semi finally. The Cybertruck will arrive someday <laughs> still, in so 2024. They, they 2024, they pushed the Cybertruck. Yeah. They said, you know, the factory construction is underway. This is on the earnings call. No <laughs> update on the windshield wiper situation. <laughs> Zero. I swear to God, they are still working on the Cybertruck. That's what's holding wiper. it back. It's three wipers in a circle. I will accept no other answer. <laughs> Just going to get super hot. They have, they have not solved this problem. Yeah. I guarantee you they have not solved this problem. It's it's the It's amazing. But Cybertruck's still vaporware. But they lowered the price of the 3 and the Y. Sales skyrocketed. They say they have a new platform coming that they're going to show with their investor day. So they're, they're stuff. Yeah, so Tesla's moving. Uh, obviously, he got some questions about Twitter. Mm -hmm. He, again, said that he didn't think Twitter was a distraction. <laughs> that it's a good marketing channel for Tesla. Look at my followers. Yeah, I don't know, man. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, Twitter has run just face first into what I might uh, be so bold as to call a predictable welcome to hell situation <laughs> uh, in which the government of India, the, the Modi administration in India, uh, is very upset about a BBC documentary 
uh, that looks at riots instead of Gujarat, Hindu versus Muslim riots. They're mm-hmm. pr- very, very bad. Uh, it basically places a lot of the blame for these riots with the current Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. This is like not a surprise to anyone that like he was an uh, inciting factor in these riots or that he he allowed it to happen. Like he's a Hindu nationalist, that's what this party is known for. This happened in twenty fourteen. Yeah. This has been the accusation all along. The BBC just made a documentary about it. If you weren't interested in such a thing, you should watch this documentary. Government of India has strict censorship laws. Mm-hmm. Like super strict censorship laws. They require social media companies to have national offices staffed by locals so that they can threaten to arrest those locals if you do not comply with their censorship laws. Well, I don't want to work. You do not want... Yeah, this is like... No, thank you. This is like one of those things where you can claim to be a free speech warrior. You are going to end up asking yourself if you would like to do business in India, Mm -hmm. one of the largest countries in the world, uh, and if you do want to do business in India... You have to staff an office full of potential hostages for the Indian government to take if you do not comply with their censorship demands. Oof. Real problem. Yeah. So India sees this documentary, again, produced by the BBC. I have many opinions about the BBC, but, you know, they at least attempt to be journalistically rigorous. Mm-hmm. It says a thing that people have been saying for a long time. They hate it. Right. This attacks the government of India. This is not respectful. Of whatever. The justification. Take it down, YouTube, Twitter, Internet Archive. <laughs> Remove your links to this thing. So YouTube caves, which is unsurprising right. for YouTube. They have the office there. They do it. This is their stance, right? This like tight rope balancing act that all the big platforms have done. Mm-hmm. Where do we comply? Where do we stand up for our users? All right, we're taking this one down. We're not serving it in India. You can get it here. But in India, you don't get to see it. By the way, Indian YouTube flooded with Indians talking about the video that was removed. <laughs> Did this work? Who knows? VPNs exist. <laughs> Strides in effect. Was this a, does this does censorship work on the internet? Who knows? Yeah, that's what that's what YouTube does. And on balance, right? YouTube is like you have a lot of lawyers, you have a lot of Google policy people. who are like actively arguing that. Twitter just takes it down, and it's like, does Twitter have a policy team anymore? Do mm-hmm. they know that the government of India is removing links to a BBC documentary? Do they know that their owner is like Elon Musk, who's like, I believe in free speech. I'm a I'm a free speech absolutist. I don't know. People asked Elon about it. He's like, I can't keep on top of everything all the time. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, th- I mean, this is it, right? If like you are against government censorship, yeah, these are the fights that you are going to have. Like this is a core fight for someone who says they are very much okay. against government censorship. So Eddie wrote a piece. You should read it. Her point is Elon has always said, I don't think companies should censor. If the people want things censored, they should pass a law. So that is – just open support of government censorship. Yep. I don't think the people of India have voted on want to remove this documentary. <laughs> but that's where we're at, is this extremely fine, tight rope walk mm-hmm. of what it actually means to support free speech against the actual threat to free speech, which is government censorship. Yeah. And I, I think Elon, I think he's like back on the Tesla SpaceX trip. He's over the Twitter adventure. And it's just going to get worse. Richard, you want to say something? Uh, well, I just wanted to know, you know, if, if you support free speech, or if anyone does support free speech, why didn't they spend $44 billion on a social network that no one wanted to buy? <laughs> that's, that's just what a real free speech supporter would have done, like Elon Musk, who does support free speech for people who have $44 billion and don't piss off the governments in countries that they want to do business in. Yeah. I mean, again, I think that I should be made uh, king of Twitter. Elon, if you're listening, I'll do it. It'll be, ex- it, it'll king? be expensive. Yeah, that's the title that I demand. I like it. King of Twitter. Uh, it'll be spendy. You know, just, Are, do you do go? Cheap. Oh, no, they're not public. I was going to be like, do you go to earnings calls? But you wouldn't have to because you're the king of Twitter. There's one earnings call you have to go to, and it will be extremely annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Audience of one. Um, we'll see. I'm just saying, like, Tesla's back on track. They need new cars. They're facing an onslaught of competition this year. Most of those cars are still vaporware. Like, can you get an F-150 Lightning? No, you cannot. No. Can you get a Rivian? No, you cannot. Can you get a Cybertruck? <laughs> Fair enough. No. Can you get a Cadillac Lyric? No, you cannot. Like, the competition is coming as a, as a drum that has been beaten, but the cars are not shipping. Yeah. Once they start shipping, once the ad dollars flow through Google's <laughs> ecosystem, <laughs> uh, 
I think Tesla is going to have to like figure out what to do. But what they know they can do right now is you know, it's going to lower prices. Yeah, people are just going to show up. And I think I'm excited for actual competition in the EV market. I think that'll be good. But the moment Elon has to turn his attention back to governments around the world want to censor Twitter. I mean, it's like, it well, was, do you think he's powder keg. wants because he doesn't want to really turn there. He's already said, if you make a law and, and we're just going to abide by that law. So if the government comes to us and says, take it down, we're going to take it down. Except, but if the United States government does that, he gets real mad. Because the, the First Amendment. He doesn't care about that. <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying. It's like he's got that. So he doesn't want to take anything down in America, right? Yeah, I don't know. But he wants to make it the safest place in the world for advertisers. Like it's it's. Yeah, he. I, when I say this is a welcome to hell problem, this is like none of it makes sense. The other social networks, you know, that Financial Times set up a massive instance. Everyone wants us to set up a massive instance. By the way, thank you to the one Vergecast listener who just went off and did it. Yes, and like beat our own team to <laughs> setting up a massive instance <laughs> with Activity Pub, with had which has quick posts in it. Like very good, congratulations. Potentially IP issue, <laughs> but for now, I'm just I'm overlooking it. It's great. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, really excited for you to talk about that in the court case in six months. Yes. If uh, if this is opposing counsel's attorney, uh, I didn't mean it. I'm not Neil Patel. This is a deep fake. You can tell because I'm looking directly into the camera. Hmm? I'm not me. Right now, a deep fake is saying this in Spanish. Who knows what's happening? Um, <laughs> the Financial Times set up a mass on server. You see this? Yeah. And they took it down. They're like, this is too hard. Wait, no, it's too much. They're like, the escalating legal and server costs are too much. We don't want to do this anymore. You said server costs? You have to be like, oh, I can now see everyone's DMs. Yeah. They're like, we, nope. don't, we don't want this in our lives. Very good. Uh, Microsoft also had earnings. What's going on with Microsoft? Uh, not not great. Good news. Pretty pretty bad news <laughs> at Microsoft. And bad news at Intel, too. <clears throat> yeah. I think there is a theme here, which is that... Everybody bought their laptops and computers in 2020 and 2021, and they didn't buy any in 2022, <laughs> especially at the end of the year. So Microsoft's earnings were really da- down across all hardware. So that means Windows, the OEMs, they're not selling enough to the OEMs because the OEMs aren't selling enough <laughs> laptops. <laughs> they're not selling surfaces because nobody wants to buy them. They're not selling Xboxes, which was kind of an interesting one. Their, their cloud's holding strong. Azure is, is doing great. That's where they're putting a lot of their investments. And I think we saw also with their layoffs. Their layoffs really particularly hit hard a lot of those hardware divisions, a lot yeah. of those places that are based in you owning the device and using all of it. So if you like that... Yeah, Microsoft's turning away from you. They don't care about you. Well, I mean, they probably still care about you. They still have the business. They're not going to get rid of they're Windows. They're going to put edge icons in your desktop to try to get you into some Microsoft services. Yeah, but it was it was not good times for Microsoft. And we saw the same thing with Intel. Intel, again, their, their, their stuff's down. Chips are down because nobody is buying the laptops to put the chips in, so none of the laptop makers are buying the chips. And the GPU business is real down. To be fair, there's only like one GPU, two there's not that many GPUs at Intel, so this is not a shock that they the Intel business was down. Or Intel also forecasting a forty percent revenue drop next quarter as well, year over year. Forty percent year over year, over year revenue drop anticipated for next year. Next quarter. Next quarter. Let's try it all again. Yeah. Get all those words correct. We'll get it right one day. Um, so yeah, forty. No, I know. I know. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. It's all this no, coffee. Right this yeah. <laughs> Do it now. All the cocaine, man. <laughs> It's all the cocaine. Uh, this is all getting cut. So a forty, they, Intel is also Intel is also anticipating a forty percent drop year over year next quarter. Not good. Okay. So Intel's in trouble. They knew they were in trouble. They they they've been anticipating this. Unlike a lot of the other companies, they still miss a lot of their forecasts. Right? Yeah. They they didn't hit any of their marks, but they also were like, it's not going to be good. And it wasn't good. And they're like, it's going to be even worse. And it's going to be even worse. And I think they're really looking towards when they get these fabs up in, what, 2024, I think, is when the first one's supposed to come online. In Ohio. Yeah. So they're like, them and, this, and, and Tesla, they're both like, just just wait. Just Don't worry about 2023. We're going to back the Cybertruck right up to our new fab. It's going to be great. Roll out some three <laughs> nanometer chips. Send we got this. AMD. Uh, we'll see. I mean, uh, again, the, the theme of these tech layoffs, you really should read Liz's piece. All of them are like, we just thought the pandemic would last forever. Yeah. We just thought people would buy a new laptop every year. And it's like, why, why <sighs> did you think of that? 
it's, it's like, it's like uh, the best example I can give is like the whole TV industry thought 3D TV would work and last forever. Yes. And it's like, guys. James Cameron still thinks that, by the way. <laughs> uh, some other lightning round stuff. Uh, it was the big Taylor Swift Ticketmaster hearing. T Swift was see. not there. I, but you, they all. She was there. She was there in, in the spirit. Every <laughs> looming. She was there in every senator's comments where their interns or whoever had written in Taylor Swift lyrics. Yep. <laughs> um, it's good. We've got a big decoder episode about Ticketmaster Monopoly coming. It's another tech stack. We're, we're going to allow you to to plug Decoder just this once because just this one. I'm just saying it's Tay-tay's coming. Involved. I'm excited about it. We were waiting for this hearing because we wanted, and I was like, now all I got is a bunch of like old senators saying <laughs> Taylor Swift. Like, like, what did I get out of this? Uh, that's gonna be good. Goldeneye remaster coming to Nintendo Switch and Xbox. We're gonna the big fight for Goldeneye is gonna be who gets to play Odd Job when we all play together. Should we do a Verge cast? Yes. I'm real bad at it. It's going to be whenever, great. Whenever David comes back from his break. He had a baby. He's, he's on break. You should take care of the baby. No, we're we just giving him time. doing Goldeneye on the Vergecast. It's happening. I, I, I will quit if we don't. Right. But, but David can't have all this time to practice. He's got a baby. He's not practicing. He's practicing with, like, one <laughs> hand. He's holding that baby. He's got him in the little pompoos. It's great. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, there's, there's four of us. Yeah. We're, oh, by the way, it has local split screen multiplayer. Which oh is like my what god! I really want. It's, it's perfect. It's going to be great. Very excited about that. Uh, TikTok has confirmed now, after reporting in Forbes, um, that it can just make videos go viral whenever it wants. Shock! I'm just shocked by yeah, this like, news. Back in the Facebook video era, we would joke that Mark Zuckerberg just had a knob and you just like turn it up. TikTok's like, oh yeah, we we have that knob, and you can pay us to turn it whenever you want. <laughs> just press the I button. Like just press the button. I feel like the TikTok balloon is going to pop. Uh, that story in Forbes. That's why the one video that really pops for us is they're like, oh, Verge got it wrong. I'm sure the yeah. TikTok, I feel certain Crank the TikTok it. is not actually an AI feed. It's just, that's that's the one. That's It's just some dude making playlists. That's all it is. <laughs> There's like 25 playlists. There's just some dude. Yeah, you could be on one. Casey Kasem the third is back there <laughs> dropping videos into playlists. And that's all it is. And we're going to find out that all this time there was no AI. I'm very excited for that. Uh, go read that story. It's actually really interesting because TikTok is so embedded in the music industry. Mm-hmm. There's just a lot of pay to play to break a song on TikTok right now, which is fascinating. And then we got to we got to end here, Alex. It's a downer. Yeah. But you know, it's the Vergecast. We have to end with Peacock. <laughs> Comcast <laughs> had earnings. Comcast, as you know, NBC division, minority investor in Vox Media, the Verge parent company, mm-hmm. Virgin Disclosure. That what's, was really good. What's going on with Peacock? So Peacock, uh, hold on, it's it's not doing great. <laughs> I truly believe that Poker Face is going to save it. Yeah. If you watch the show with Natasha Leone, I almost it's not out yet. Yeah, it just came out. It's out today. It's out today. Some of us got to watch a little bit of it early. Oh, I, I swear I didn't Some watch six episodes. Used to get screeners. <laughs> yeah. It was great. Highly, highly recommend it. But yeah, they, they, Comcast overall, NBC Universal overall did face big losses. Peacock uh, just recently surpassed a really big number for them. Guess how many subscribers? Six. 20 million. Hey, that's pretty good. Yeah. It's, it? What is it, a tenth of what Netflix <laughs> is doing? I would just say yeah. it's more subscribers than I have. Yeah. Like, subscribe to my sub stack. <laughs> I don't have a Twitter anymore. What am I doing? Yeah, so so it's it's taking losses, and it's a loss on the Comcast balance sheet. I think we've always said, in the go ninety scale, where the zero means they're alive, and the ninety means they're they're boot doomed. This is now like a seventy to eighty. Wow, you're going all the way seventy eighty. I I think so. I think Peacock probably has the best chance of being the first big broadcast streamer that goes, actually, this is not for us. I don't know what they're going to do, though. Are, cause are you sure that they'll do that or that they'll try and buy some other streamer that is also failing? Who? They're not going to buy Paramount, because Paramount has been like in this, we're doing it by ourselves thing before anybody else did. And they, and they have the um, uh, Yellowstone verse. The yeah, they got the, they got the yellow, verse, 1923. Oh my god, 1923 is so good. Do you know what? Every single year of American history, people in Montana have shot each other. With Tommy guns. <laughs> <laughs> that show, we've been watching that show. It's Yellowstone. Yeah. Yellowstone proper. The, yeah. 
Okay, the conceit of, I don't know if, uh, um, this is crazy we're talking about Rush House. It's just, if you think about that show is having the lawyer son, the business daughter, and then the Call of Duty son, it just like <laughs> locks into place. You're like, all right, we need to have a Call of Duty cutscene in the middle of this episode. And it just always happens. It's so, like, the most compelling thing. Is it good TV? I it, don't know. I've been watching it. It's very yeah, entertaining. I love yeah, it. There's like, oh, the cutscene is here. <laughs> Just bam, bam, bam. Like, yeah, look at it. And they're on horses. They, they introduce characters just for the Call of Duty son to murder them. <laughs> it's like, very, like, oh, that motherfucker's going to die. But he's sad about it. He's yeah, sad he, about it. He, not, feels, he feels grief. Not, I think actually by season four, he's like, this is what I do. <laughs> I just kill. Anyway, but that's, that Peacock had, that's what Peacock had going for Yeah, Peacock. It. Peacock. The first four seasons. It's got the first four seasons. Paramount Plus. Paramount Plus has all of the adjacent shows. So it's got the the fancy one with Harrison Ford. It's got the Sylvester Stallone one where he goes to Oklahoma to start a mob. (laughs) It's him and like Martin Starr just out there mobbing up. It's great. I'm going to watch them all. See, that's that's why Peacock won't buy Paramount Plus. (laughs) Yeah. They, they, they can't afford it. They're all in on the Taylorverse. Yeah. So so Peacock is not doing great. It has not had any hits. It's still hoping Poker Face. Like, it's put a lot of, of time and energy into making Poker Face a thing. This is the new show with Natasha Lyonne. It comes from Ryan Johnson, who did... Uh, Knives Out. Yeah. So who did? it comes from Ryan Johnson, who did Knives Out and the Star Wars movies and stuff like that. So they're really... Ryan Johnson, a Verge fan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, The Verge makes a cameo and knows that, too. That's true. It did. Yeah. I screamed. I was with my mom, and I was like, see? I have a job. I looked at my 17-year-old niece and nephew and said, that's cool, right? And they're like, it was cool. <laughs> my mom did. She was like, it's fine. <laughs> Cigarette. Uh, so, yeah, Peacock not doing great. I, I'll be surprised if it lasts. And, and, and I think the big concern, though, if something happens to Peacock, what happens to shows like Poker Face, mm-hmm. which is a legitimately like, great show. It's super, super entertaining. But 20 million people max are going to be watching it because that's how many people have subscribed. <laughs> well, we're trying to get more people. We'll see. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Right, Not well, optimistic. You're putting them at 70 to 80. I'm at, I'm at 70 to 80 wow. now. All right. Big call from Alex Kranz. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Peacock, 70 to 80 on the Go90 scale of gym streaming services. Let us know what you think. Of Peacock and its rating on the Go90 scale. You can tweet it out. She's Alex H. Kranz. Wow. Thanks. Tweet it, Richard. He's at RJCC. Oh my God. Our list is wrong. Monica is at MC Squared 96. I'm at Reckless. I do check it like once a day and just like all the tweets. Yeah. So if you want to get a like, you can still tweet at me. It'll just be delayed from what's happening. I'm trying to be off of feeds based media for a little bit. It's I do nice. I feel like I'm rewiring my brain. I have read a lot of magazines <laughs> on PDF. <laughs> God, do you know the new editor in chief of Sound and Vision is an ex AVS forum poster? That's like, like that's where we are in like the media cycle. Perfect. We're like the hardcore forum posters are now the editors in chief of yeah. like the legendary stereo. How how many how many staff came from the Verge came from the Verge forums? Uh, a surprising amount. Yeah, it's a good path. I mean, I came from the Engadget comments. I love this. Pretty good. Don't look up those comments. <laughs> I, presumably, I will to delete them all. You're good. Please don't. <laughs> It's all going to be fine. Uh, Wednesday show. What's going on the Wednesday show? So on the Wednesday show, I'm talking to Sean Hollister about the Steam Deck. Do Liam had to cut Sean us off. To <laughs> we almost got Liam to. We got, almost bullied him into buying one. It was great. I'm also talking with Catherine Chintacosta about faking your own death online. Surprisingly common. Just recently happened with a romance novelist. Created a whole bunch of yeah conversations. And then I don't know if I can talk about this last one yet. But we're gonna have a, a really special one coming up next week as well. So you gotta stay tuned and tell them to hear it because it's gonna be really good and exciting. But I can't talk about it right now. It's gonna be great. All right, you can call the Vergecast hotline eight six six Verge eleven. Here's That's, what I'll tell you about. Yeah. Listener and now viewer feedback. Last week on the show, I was like, "Man, audio sucks." Usually, I say anything is bad. A flurry of responses. Yeah. One. One <laughs> person tweeted, and I was like, "I don't know, it might be good." That's how we know. That's how I know. It sucks. <laughs> but if you are that one person, 866-VERGE-11. I'm asking for the call. Call him. <laughs> Just call me. That's his number. All right. That's the Verge House. Thank you for listening in your car. If you're watching this for the first time in years, we're so sorry. We just, <laughs> we're not. Hi. We're not. Go home and do your cocaine. That's it. That's the Verge Cast <laughs> Rock Roll.